James, here in Cusick Park, after a result that we probably didn't expect, uh, Clare 331, Waterford 222. Firstly, the game on its own, never mind you add in the Munster Championship, is one hell of a trim. And how do you put your mind around that at all? Um, tricky one, Jonathan. Like, I expected a, a big game out of Waterford here today in the sense that, they, that their life is on the line. And uh, despite what was going to happen in Thurles, that they were going to have to look after their own business first. And in fairness, they, they, they Clare came out from the very off and they just blitzed Waterford from 1 to 25. And they put in a fantastic performance in front of the home crowd. Waterford had no answers. The ball wouldn't stick. The hurling was slow. Their pace was slow. They were very flat. Energy was very poor. So just an all-round disappointing day from Waterford. Right from the off, you looked at it. For, I think Reedy scored from the throw-in. Then they got the next four or five points in a row. They got the goals at key moments. But Waterford, they looked like a, a beaten docket. Even you commented on it as well. We were chatting beforehand. When they came in, it just felt like there were the results of recent weeks had maybe affected them, and not just on the pitch. In fact, in the performance, the mentality, they just looked a little bit off. Yeah. Well, the, the first thing I think that, that uh, surprised me was the amount of changes that was on the team. So when you've got your talisman, like Stephen Bennett, only scoring a point from play in the last couple of games and having him essentially dropped out, as, as well as Mikey Kiley, you know, and all the changes and the position changes and where Jamie Barron started, corner forward, Isaac Leeson gone to the centre back, Tyke to work at the full back, you know, it just, it just screamed this organisation, like in a bit of, it, nearly even an element of panic. Like we've never seen that from Liam Cahill's Waterford, whereby the structure of their whole team has changed or and it seemed disoriented. And even the body language, like you often hear Ron McGarrow talking about body language for, for his rugby teams, that it's, it's nearly, it's, it's, it's as big as of a communicative factor as, as verbal would be so they just looked downbeat today even after when the when the second goal went in I think sorry uh, who got the goal was it Fitzgerald got the goal uh, right after half time four minutes after half time game was dead so the game was dead and they no answer after that and then it became a case of just pot shots and living off scraps so bad, bad day all round spoke to Shane O'Donnell there afterwards as well and he he spoke about enjoying the new position kind of a right wing forward position the movement the freedom that like he had before he might have had two or three lads double teeing him inside he but he had so much room he was almost that spark that uh, Claire needed in, in that opening half the run the power and they just couldn't handle with him but he had he too many sp too much space there it felt like Waterford were so open yeah it, it was like it, we, we had a great view of it up here and you, you would think after the first few minutes, let's say, where they were trying to isolate Peter Duggan inside with Reedy and, and Galvin, that, that maybe Water would drop back, especially against the breeze, and try and pack out the defence of small, but that didn't happen at all for 75, 77 minutes for the whole game. And just for a finish there, Claire were just picking off. A nice handy ball into the corner. Forwards would come out, pick it up, roll across, then put it over the bear. Much of the enjoyment of the Clare, the Clare people, but Water had no answer at all today. They had no organisation. Like, in fairness, Tyg de Burka was a massive laugh. He went off after maybe four or five minutes with, the, with, the, with an ankle injury, so a lot of his magnitude to go off. So you're missing your three and your six after essentially four minutes. There's huge losses, and you could tell that the, the, the Waterford defence was complete and organised. But again, the Clare forwards, I have to say, their touch work was excellent, their link play was excellent, their shooting was. Was you could put down, was, you look at the scoreboard and you say the shooting was very good, but they still had 19 wides. You know, so and I see the, their, their, their second 15 is a call over here, a train here behind us, and they have, um, they're pushing for places. So I think Brian Lohan will be looking at any avenue for, for improvement to one of them as they're shooting. Almost the perfect day for Clare from that point of view. The game, in effect, was won on the half time whistle. The goal chances, they got two in the first half, one just before the uh, first half time break uh, there as well. But they had maybe two or three other good chances as well. It took Sean O'Brien, you know, a couple of big, big saves as well. Like, it could have been curtains altogether at half time. Yeah, you think the, the, the type of goals they got then were consolation goals. They got one from a, you know, I think you could call it a free, and one then of a. You know, uh, a fortuitous goal near the end, but like Sean O'Brien was excellent today. Like he's one of the Waterford guys that you, you look at himself and Desi Hutchison who put in some great performances, the two of them. And uh, I think Desi could have finished with one six. You know, Sean O'Brien only farm in the first half. They would have gone in probably 15, 16 points down at least. So he can be part of his performance today. But again, I looked at half time the goal chances. It was five to Clare, one to Waterford. It just screamed domination, and that's what exactly what it was. It was a demolition job from Clare today. And I think Waterford they have a lot of regrouping to do and a bit of soul searching because. You know, you'd say this is the culmination of three hard years' work with, with Liam Cahill. You think this is the this is the year they're going to push on, and they, they promised so much this year, and the promise is all. And like even I myself would would be would have been a great fan of theirs to say, especially after the league, thinking that they'd definitely put up to Limerick. But again, how wrong I was. And here here I am in QC Park with Clare, uh, eleven on points with Limerick heading for Munster final. And at the start of the year, I didn't think they'd make it out of the group. So this year's championship is full of surprises. The game itself, then as well, as if. It wasn't done at half time. The goal, second goal from Fitzgerald, just I think five minutes into the second half, just 
as if you could put a pin on it, pin on it then the game petered out of that Claire just shot the lights out shot a lot of wides as well but it's just it's hard to describe a game that was so much on the line for Waterford they knew not even a win today was enough so you obviously they're coming in with a lot of focus on this get your job done but how do you describe how a thing can go so badly wrong yeah like if if you've, if you've won bad performance let's say last week at the head you'd say something you'd say it's an off day you know when you put two really bad performances together it's, it's, it screams of something deeper like I know Clare are good today don't get me wrong they're, they're high flying there's a real feel good factor amongst Clare even with their 20s and their senior team going fierce well so but that can't be just it there has to be something deeper in water I can't put my finger on it it, it looked like they were a touch over trained you know I say that respectfully it looked like they, they were lethargic really tired there was no connection and like when you're tired and there's no energy the ball won't stick the passes go astray everything just kind of goes arse ways if you like and that's what it looked like here so I think there's going to be a lot of soul searching both on Liam Cattle's behalf for his own position like is he going to stay in Waterford where does he go and also when he looks at the players he have now does he believe that he has enough to win the Ireland two, two big questions for himself yeah, the post-mortem, I think, in Waterford is going to go on quite the while. And even noticing, speaking to Liam there afterwards, he was asked, was he staying on? And he was like, we'll have to see. We'll have to think about it. We'll have to see, like, what more can he bring? He's going to speak to the players. It is at that sort of a crossroads where you go two or three months back. Everyone's second favourite team for the All-Ireland. Everybody's speaking about the depth in their squad. But yet, sport is so fickle. And we speak about momentum, but the opposite of is just even worse as we've seen I suppose in this championship and you spoke before and as well Waterford's record in the Munster Championship is abysmal really for the squad of players and the talent that they've had over the years yeah that, that, that rounds out two victories in the last six years in Munster that's an abysmal record like of, of, of any standard at all to say you think of a, a, a county as proud as Waterford with the, the generational hurdles they've had and in the, they were building towards something really good over the last couple of years and I fully believe this is the year they're going to probably take on the, the number one team in Limerick and they've just flattered they've, they've deceived us in one way and you see their league campaign like how good they were in the final how they just decimated Cork who were on the, were on the high as well and then they got off to a good start against Tipperary, put up a great challenge against Limerick on the home ground and you're thinking now they're going to kick on then they produce a performance like they had last week and then rounded out with, with, with an abysmal performance like they had here. So it's going to be a tough one. There's going to be a lot of, soul, a lot of as you said, um, post-mortems with regard to the players themselves, the management, the supporters are going to ask questions. You know, there's going to be an awful lot of answers to, to try, try to be found this winter. It's a little cloudy now, as you can see the shade is coming down. The clouds have come down in the last uh, couple of minutes, the last uh, half an hour in particular. But it was sunny there for large spells. You know, it felt like maybe not go over the top, it's in 95 all over again with that great summer and then Claire coming on in the dominance and, and Lowen being involved in the team. But you felt the crowd, like obviously Claire must have had 98% of the uh, the, whole, the crowd here as well a big roar it's the perfect day really isn't from from Clare because like you come into this game with a kind of a weird do you have to win it should you not win it is it better to win it anyways but yet it's the perfect day really for them yeah like I was I was looking at the game before and I'm thinking because Watford had everything on the line I actually backed them to win this game I thought that if it came down to the real nitty gritty in the crunch time that they'd have the drive to do it because of where they're where they're standing at the table and you know I think you, back, you see there clear they're, they're in the final as it is they've made six changes the two of their main tellies man in, in Tony Kelly and John Connolly are starting so you're thinking things were lined up for Watford to try and produce performance and take care of their own business it didn't happen you know but in fairness to Clare it shows that they were talking about the depth of the Watford squad only you know, a couple of weeks back and here we are and I'm looking at the Clare guys and they've got a squad now too everyone that they introduced today made an impact a positive impact might I say from, from even their sub who came in which is, which is a rarity you don't see that too often uh, to the forwards they brought in in, in the likes of Meehan and, and Mounty so they've got forwards they've got pace they've got a lot of numbers in attack so they're going to be hard to stop you look out there we said there's still a few of the hardcore doing a couple of frees and whatnot. most of them have gone out but there was a good bunch of the rest of the Clare squad Kelly, Condon, the, the, the guys that weren't involved today, the star names out doing their running exercises there, Lowen looking on. It's the perfect first scenario for him now as well. He said to the guys, you know, you got to be turn up and training this week, the next couple of weeks, or, or you won't be in the team for the Munster final. Yeah, it looks like they've, got, they've struck a good balance in the sense that, you know, watching them, they, they train for a good probably 50 minutes. Like, uh, a lot of hard ball drills and a lot of hard running, so the, the second 15 plus the couple of, couple of 
I suppose talisman. They, they've trained hard here. They're putting their hands up. That's what you want in a panel. You, want, you don't just want the first 15 or 16 you know, carrying the whole thing. You want 35 guys challenging the whole time. And when you get that, it breeds a, a successful squad. And so when you've got like, a famous victory here and you've got the management team down on the sideline and they're watching over, and everyone is jovial, obviously, after victory, but they're still putting the hard graft here for 45, 50 minutes. So credit to them. And they're, as I said, yeah, they're going to be hard stop because they've, they've struck the balance right. Two weeks' time is going to be massive now. Limerick on the line. There was a great draw, entertaining draw last week. With how much Limerick had their mind on that, I suppose we'll find out in two weeks' time. Limerick were the, you know, you had Limerick, you had Waterford underneath, and then you had pretty much everyone else prior to the start of the of the championship. I think players have gone up a couple of steps of that ladder here now. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like even if I, if I if I rewind back a couple of months before the championship even kicked off. I, I, I clear, truthfully speaking, probably ranked fifth in Munster. Do you know how wrong was I? It just goes to show that what you're looking at from the from the outside in means absolutely nothing. It's what it's what you're looking at from the inside out that make, makes all the difference. And that credit to them. They, they've put up a really good run in the championship. They've they've challenged everyone and they've beaten most of them, obviously, and they remain unbeaten themselves. But there's a different task coming in two weeks' time. Thurless, big pitch. You, I wonder who will Limerick have back? Will, will, will Galan be back? Will Lynch be back? Hard to know. You know, more minutes get into Seamus Flanagan, so you could see a different animal that you, that you saw here last week. But either way, it's going to be a good tussle and another good battle for Clare. They're guaranteed another game after that, so they can just go off, throw the shackles off and go at Limerick again. We'll talk about this game a hell of a lot, I think, between now and, then, and two weeks' time. Limerick still the favourites. Brian Lowen said afterwards they're still the favourites. We're good in as underdogs. He's a probably a couple of percentage of that playing the, playing the game, but he's probably true in a lot what he says as well. Yeah, like I, I was saying beforehand, like if you look at the, the game here last week, whose stock went up and whose stock went down. Uh, both teams' stock went up when you consider that Limerick were missing a couple of their marquee forwards and they obviously had Hegarty sent off for, for the last 10 or, 10 or 12 minutes. So And they, meant they still managed to come away with a point when Clare were going at them with everything in front of a rapturous home crowd. So, again, Limerick stock went up last week, but then Clare pulled up them, obviously, came away with a point themselves. Their stock went up. So you're, you're looking at two, I won't say, they're finely balanced teams, obviously, coming in from similar positions, and, and they're, they've got momentum behind them, they've positivity behind them, they've, they've crowds behind them, but still, there's no reason to take Limerick off, top, off, off, off the top, uh, top of the crew. So I, I'm, I'm back in Limerick for the final. I think you'll be joined by many people in that regard. Quickly, before we let you go, I can't uh, let go we get into the Leinster final without uh, giving it uh, a, a, couple of, a couple of seconds uh, talking point as well. Henry Shefflin's probably going to be happy the way he slightly come in off the radar, made a couple of changes, brought in a couple of bodies. First target achieved in getting t- into the Leinster final. Yeah, like what's a successful year for, for Galway? You know, it's asking to Leinster final, obviously against his home country, so we'll have uh, round two uh, of, of the... The, uh, the handshake part two, if you want to call it that, but look, they've done well, they've done fine, they've, they've come through relatively unscathed, you'd like, you'd like to think, in the sense that they've got Conor Whelan back from his injury from the first day, he played very well yesterday, Dave Burke is probably the only injury where you have at the moment, but they've got Roland Glennon back, they've got Jason Flynn back, so they've come through the, the round-robin stage, relatively injury-free, you could say, with a bit of momentum and a good Leinster final to look forward to.